Hello, this is Cynthia Sue Larson with RealityShifters.com talking with you today about my thoughts on Tom Campbell and his thoughts on the Mandela Effect. Now this is a reaction video going a little deeper into some of the things he said and including thoughts that I had that did not have the opportunity to get shared during our recent conversation that we had for the International Mandela Effect Conference. That's You can look it up on the YouTube and there's a channel, the International Mandela Effect Conference channel. And on there you can find the uh, mini conference we did with Tom Campbell talking about his big theory of everything, virtual reality and the Mandela Effect. And so when Tom came on our show, he said, I thought about it a little, the Mandela Effect, because I know that's what you guys are all about. And I found four different things that contribute to it. So I don't think it's just one thing. I think there are several things that lead us to this. And so, if you, again, I do recommend that you watch that video at some point. It will clarify where Tom is coming from with regard to his view of reality, how it's primarily consciousness-based. There is something he calls the larger consciousness system. There are individual units of consciousness and so on and so forth. And he really gets into what he's thinking about. In fact, um, you can even go, go further and study some of the things he's written, look at his books. But that is a good starting point is the interview that we did, that little mini conference that we had. So the first thing that Tom brings up is something about observers having individual subjective realities. And this is so key, so important. Um, that's, I would put it first too. In fact, you'll start, you might recognize it if you've watched a lot of my videos. Okay, here's what he says. Well, every observer has his own reality because it's his interpretation of the data that he gets. So far, there is not a reality back then that existed. There is no master reality that exists. It only exists in the minds of the players, and the players all have a somewhat different reality because they interpret the data that they get. So there isn't a reality that is kind of the right, the right answer to what it was. So that's one thing. So. Just looking from a perspective of consciousness, there is no the reality that was. It doesn't exist, never has existed. It's a bunch of individual realities. And now we can look at it and see what we in general, most of us you know, uh, see or heard. So there's this idea that there is no an right answer to what it was. Uh, we all have our own reality. And if you, as I said before, if you're watching my channel, then this sounds really familiar, I think, at this point. Because, and I love it. I love how Tom starts contemplating the Mandela effect from this point of view. Because uh, when you look at the idea of subjective reality, then, um, and he's talking about what I've often described as objective reality from this materialist, objectivist view of the world, the <laughs> of all of reality. Uh, and I agree with Tom, it does seem like it's consciousness based. Uh, so when he says um, these things, it really reminds me of when I've written and talked about the quantum paradigm. And I did co-author that paper with physicist George Weissman, one of the hippies who saved physics, which you can read about in that book by that title. Uh, we co-authored a paper that's available on my website, realityshifters.com. If you go to the Cynthia Larson page about me, uh, just scroll down. You can find it with other published papers. This one is The Quantum Paradigm and Challenging the Objectivity Assumption with myself and George Weissman. And basically what we were saying is that there is no such thing as objectivity again. Uh, we said that before the experiments came out showing in a laboratory repeatable experimental condition that that does seem to be the case. That you can have two observers in the same place and same time and so forth getting two completely different results. This is why I've been covering it the last couple of years. So this is a really big idea. It's huge. And I think that that's the first one of the four that Tom Campbell talks about here. And it's so important because, and it's paradigm shifting, because a lot of people constantly assume, even Mandela affected people assume that there's one big objective reality, or you can somehow get back to your correct reality. When in fact, what it looks a lot more like to those of us, I've been studying this for more than 20 years, um, some of the other researchers that I've mentioned um, along the way that have written books about it would include um, Mary Rose Barrington, who wrote just one of those things, and she's no longer with us, but she did describe things moving around very much the way I described reality shifts. In my book, Reality Shift, I described Larry Hagman being alive again, 
and we don't have the Hagman effect, and we've got the Mandela effect, but it might as well have been the Hagman effect because that was the first time the idea of a dead person being alive again, other than a famous spiritual leader, um, like Jesus Christ being alive again, um, hadn't really been talked about in much of the literature anywhere. So this is, these are big ideas from the Mandela effect that you'll be familiar with, and you can start thinking about this. Again, I recommend check out the entire conversation, the mini conference we had with Tom Campbell, and you'll get to see all of the grand sweeping expanse of his ideas and how it all fits together. The second thing that Tom talks about that I'd like to respond to is pattern matching in consciousness. And this one has to, the way, it has to do with the way that we interpret what we see and what we observe, attributes of perception, as he calls it. And he says, we perceive things and remember things in our memory. This is just kind of the fundamentals of the way consciousness works. We work with pattern matching. That's kind of the fundamental way we do things. We work on pattern matching, and what happens is we'll get a new image and we'll go into our data bank to find a pattern that fits it. Now, if we can find an exact fit, oh great, we'll put that out. But if we can't find an exact fit, we'll pull out anything that even fits a little bit. If it fits sort of well, we'll pull that out and that's what it'll be. In other words, that's what we remember. So it's like we've got these um, sort of matching bins in our memory bank, and that's what he's describing. Now clearly, that Tom, okay, I'm going to continue. Tom then shares his experience with people frequently calling his wife a similar yet incorrect name that starts with the same letters. Tom's wife is named Pamela, yet frequently when they go out and meet people, even after she's introduced herself as Pamela, a few minutes later someone will say, Oh, Patricia. So Tom is pointing out that we might be fooling ourselves with some of the examples of what we think are Mandela effects that actually have more to do with the fallibility of our minds and memories. So I did mention that in my more than 20 years of researching this phenomena, um, I think I've talked about this in previous videos, I've been very careful to winnow out those examples or those cases where people weren't exactly sure. So what you're seeing when you read my Reality Shifters newsletter, it comes out every month and has for more than 20 years, you're reading case-by-case, case, first uh, experience, first-hand ac accounts of these reality shifts, personal Mandela effects. Sometimes they're group Mandela effects. And what I've done is I've gone back and forth with the originator of the experience, usually asking them directly in a number of different ways to find out if there's any possibility that they might have been confused in some way in this exact frame of um, confusion where they're not exactly sure so they do remember things a certain way but they to account for the fallibility of human mind memory um, maybe they do remember some more details some what we might call anchor memories so I'm doing a back and forth conversation that doesn't really show up in the finished product of the reality shifters easing because I'm asking them to revise uh, and add to their account to include those um, any kind of evidence that suggests that they're not just simply confused in this way. Um, also, I think it's really important at this juncture to bring up the work of Tony Jenks, who wrote a book called Disappearing Object Phenomenon and Investigation. And that DOP, or DOPP, Disappearing Object Phenomenon, I guess just one P. <laughs> Getting confused with Mary Rose Barrington. See, that's an example of this right there. Anyway, because she has a book, Jot, with two T's, just one of those things, whereas Tony Jenks has the book, Disappearing Object Phenomenon. These are all books about reality shifts, personal Mandela effect experiences. Anyway, in Tony's book, he made a comparison of experiences of personal Mandela effects, and he has a background in psychology. So when he did this experiment, he was doing it with the rigors of a college professor that he was at the time. And what he was doing is finding out if there were any differences between those who experienced, as he calls it, disappearing object phenomenon, what we would call personal Mandela effects or reality shifts. And he found there was no significant difference of any sort. And he had substantially statistically significant sample size groups. And you can read about that in his work. So what that suggests to me is that people that experience the Mandela effect are not somehow having a different thing going on in their mind where they tend to be confabulators or conspiracy theorists, as some people would call Mandela-affected people. Um, I don't personally like that term because, to me, this phenomenon goes back much 
earlier than the word conspiracy ever was used, and it affects a lot more people, and it has consistently. And I see a scientific basis for it. So therefore, I think discrediting it in that um, linguistic fashion is unfair, uncalled for, and disrespectful to those who are Mandela affected. So while I've witnessed cases of what Tom calls this pattern matching, and so I can see his point there, and I do agree it might contribute to some cases, I don't think it's going to account for the majority of most of the cases that we hear about. And uh, Elizabeth Loftus was um, featured on a program with Moneybag73 and the Rippin' Rabbit on the Rippin' Rabbit show Mandela Monthly. And back when she was on that program, she talked about false memories, and she talked about this idea that she has of false memories being the primary explanation for the Mandela effect. Now notice, Tom Campbell's not calling it false memories, it's to his credit. So he's actually saying, hey, there's a pattern matching tendency, let's take a look at that. Brilliant. Um, going back to Elizabeth Loftus, when she was on the show with Moneybag73 and the Rip and Rabbit, and I definitely recommend you check that out, she did talk about some of the examples of the Mandela effect that she herself remembered just like Tom does, which was interesting to see, to hear that in her voice, to hear that reaction. Anyway, uh, to me, this is a bigger thing than just simple misremembering. There are too many other examples of it. It goes too far back and so on and so forth. But it's valid, and I have been considering it in over 20 years of doing the research that I've been doing with it. Number three, this has to do with uh, collective consciousness. Now here, Tom Campbell is describing a third factor related to the Mandela effect that he considers being involved. And he says another thing we should think about is that uh, that's this thing is that there's a thing called collective consciousness. Collective consciousness is any group of people who have a connection, who feel they have a connection together. They basically form a collective consciousness. So, you know, you now have a collective consciousness when you work with all the people you work with. There's a collective consciousness that goes with that. Or if you do child care, there's a collective consciousness that goes with that. You have a collective consciousness with your nation. You have one with humanity. You know, Carl Jung called these archetypes. They're usually basically collective consciousness pieces that you identify with and you connect. Well, the collective consciousness is just the vector sum of all the consciousness that are in the membership that are in the group. So you get stuff out of the collective consciousness and you, t and you um, take that on in the membership that are in the group. So you know you become more like that. Now you affect the whole, but you only affect the whole a little bit because you're one person and there's maybe 100,000 in your collective. So you don't affect the whole that much, but the whole affects you more. So, and then his example is, so you work for IBM, and after you've been there four or five years, guess what? You start wearing blue shirts, you start dressing like they do, you start talking like they do, you start having the same interests that they do, because it's part of the collective consciousness. Okay, so I find this super interesting, because I've been noticing that as well, and I think a lot of us in the Mandela Effect community talk about things like the Mr. Smith Effect, or take the download, that kind of terminology. You'll be talking to someone, and it seems at some point they start agreeing with you, yeah, yeah, I remember it that way, like Elizabeth Loftus and Tom Campbell, or anybody. I mean, these Mandela Effects are pretty extensive and pervasive. They're all over the place. I can't even go to a grocery store without seeing dozens of them. So anyway, um, it, because we might notice it this way, we and sometimes we might remember both. Like uh, that happens to me. I remember both. And this would be a brilliant way to explain how we can kind of be going back and forth. Um, sometimes we see flip-flopping reality shifts, flip-flopping Mandela effects. So this would be an ex explanation factor that you're moving in and out of a collective consciousness bubble of reality, if you will. Now, Tom didn't call it a bubble of reality, but that's something we've talked about before on the International Mandela Effect Conference. Number four. Now, this one is the paranormal likes to open our minds. And here Tom talks about the fourth factor that he sees operating with the Mandela Effect. And this is interesting. I really like this one, too. He says sometimes the larger consciousness system can change things up up on us just to, to get our attention and open our mind. It likes to do that. For instance, crop circles. You know you have crop circles and overnight, one night, totally dark, maybe a few lights running around, no sound, and the next morning you've got 34 acres covered with a very complex design that isn't just straight lines. It's all kinds of curves and things that would probably take a surveying crew of 20 people like three weeks to lay it out with their transoms if they were trying to do it. 
So the system does things like that, just as wake-up calls. Hey, think out of the box. Reality is not just little thing, this little thing that you think it is. Open your mind. You know, there's more going on here than you're aware of. Well, again, we jump to conclusions and make up the first thing that comes to our mind. Oh, aliens did it. You know, the aliens must be doing those things. Well, not necessarily. You know, the larger consciousness system triggers lots of people with paranormal experiences just to open their minds. I got triggered to open my mind with an ability to be debug software. This is still Tom Campbell talking. I know a lady who after a week after her mother died, she got a phone call from her mother. The phone rang, she picks up the phone, and it's mom telling her, I'm okay, I just wanted to let you know everything's fine. And of course she was freaked out. So she took the phone and slammed it down into the receiver because she thought somebody was messing with her. And what a cruel joke it was. And then she realized that wasn't the case at all. She just hung up on her mother who was trying to get in touch with her. So, people have these kinds of things. The system goes out of its way to help us see bigger pictures because only when we see bigger pictures do we start becoming seekers and, let's see, start learning and, and um, grooving. So, the system does that all over as part of the Mandela Effect. That was my fourth one. Is the system often plays these sorts of games just to rattle us a little bit to get us to open our mind and think out of the box instead of just being stuck in this little materialistic groove and it just does that to individuals um, and it does that like in crop circles to whole populations and it does with other th things as well so a lot of extraterrestrial things that people see you know with spaceships landing in their yard and chatting with aliens and so on all the system has to, has to do to create that is put that data in their data stream that's it and then it's there, it's real. They interpret it, it wakes them up, and after that they're different people. They start researching. They start wanting to understand things. So that's part of the Mandela Effect. Okay, that is interesting, and that goes way deeper than just the Mandela Effect, but as you know, the Mandela Effect does tend to touch everything. So now we've gotten into crop circles, little uh, green men, aliens, and so forth. Um, I have had my own uh, experiences with uh, other consciousness, um, what you might call ET experiences, and I've um, I've started talking about that a little bit. I never wanted to mix up the message that I'm bringing with the Mandela effect and these other experiences, but Tom has a valid point. If we look at the way we interpret all of our information, how is um, what is seeming real to our senses? How do we know it's really real? How do we know it's not? Uh, just been created from consciousness as quickly as crop circles might be in a way that we don't know how to do that. So getting our attention is also a key idea having to do with the work of, uh, well, lots of people actually. I think John Mack got into the consciousness uh, way of viewing the UFO phenomenon. He, I think he's the first one I heard about bringing that up. But another early person early on was Jacques Vallée. He uh, co-authored a book recently called Trinity with Paula Harris. And then the book that I'm getting to right now is one called Contact Modalities by Grant Cameron and Desta Barnaby. And the two of them co-authored a book having to do with all these different ways that consciousness or the paranormal likes to get our attention, wake us up, and how we can interact with that actively as well. So that's a really fabulous book. Um, I also dive into this a little bit in my book, Reality Shifts, getting into the idea of how consciousness is like a waking dream, a lucid dream. And when we wake up in real life, it's like lucid living. And when we play with the consciousness that we can start to realize that we truly are versus these physical realities we move through, we start to get a whole new take on reality as a whole and what's going on. So, in fact, in that book, I do mention with the idea when people ask, why is reality shifting? Why is the Mandela effect happening? In reality shifts, I say the answer is two words, because. It's not one word, because. It's two words, and it means be cause, be causal, and be a creator. So with that, I'd like to leave you with uh, just my summary of the four things again. I think they're brilliant. I really think it's worth your time to watch that video. I know it's a long one, two and a half hours. 
at the International Mandela Effect Conference, mini-conference with Tom Campbell, talking about his big theory of everything, virtual reality, and the Mandela Effect. But it does summarize his ideas. It is interesting, and it'll get you thinking, which is very good. And then these four things, again, that I love. Number one, the subjective reality one. That's what I'd call it. Number two is pattern matching. It's something I check for to make sure people aren't just confused when they send me a report. Number three is the idea that we are... Um, collective consciousness. So we have these bubbles of reality with um, other people in the groups that we belong to. And number four, paranormal likes to open our minds. And because. (laughs) So this is a brilliant genius summary, I think, uh, for contributing factors. I think it's really worth your time, again, to watch the whole thing. So until next time, this is Cynthia Sue Larson inviting you, as always, to please keep asking my favorite question, how good can it get? Thanks so much.